Okay, Bobby, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your organisation? Yeah, sure. So, Bobby McCormick is my name. I work in Development Perspectives, which is a development education organisation based in Drogheda, but we work around the country and with partners in different parts of the world. Uh, my own background is that I'm a lecturer in Development Studies in Dundalk IT, and on a personal level, I'm married. Uh, we have one son, his name is Olin. I'm a big Man United fan, and I've got a new great Dane. Excellent. And can you tell me a bit uh, specifically what type of work uh, Development Perspectives does yeah. and what type of programs you run? Yeah, so we specialise in development education. So essentially, we work mostly within the non formal sector with adults. So other organisations might be working more in schools or colleges, but we kind of more or less work within the space of outside of the formal education sector. So that's the majority of our work. That's a good 80% of our work, I would say. Um, and we focus on trying to deal with issues of poverty, inequality and climate change. And we do that through education. And can you give me one particular example of a, a significant partnership or collaboration over the past number of years? Our main partnership is with an organisation called Uvikura. They're Tanzanian based. Uh, we've worked with them since 2007. And so every year we've got a program called Insight and Uvikuda would be our longest lasting partner for the delivery of that project. So they would be, I would imagine, the, the best example for us of a partnership that has worked well over a period of time. And how did that come about and what does it entail? Yeah, so for us I think how partnerships come about, and this one in particular is kind of by chance, and I know that sounds as if it's, well surely there should be a bit more planning to that, but I think like in life, a lot of the best partnerships come through building a relationship first before having something that's more formalised. So we met with Ubi Kuda a couple of years previous to that and developed very organically quite a positive working relationship with people who worked within Ubi Kuda. And then from there, discussions, meetings led to the, to the case that we realised we could do a lot together, we could work together. And then from there, we became much more formal, if you like, in our meetings and in our in our relationship with, with each other but certainly there was no kind of master plan in mind in 2006 or oh, we've got to have a b or c set up it was much more informal and what are the specifics of uh, what each partner brings to the table and what are you delivering on what's the shared vision so the, the main project that we focus on is the delivery of insight which is one particular project but we did sign the memorandum of understanding that lasted for three years that we then renew. So kind of every year we have a meeting on a kind of formal level, but then every three years we, we have a really strong sit down where we look at what's working, what's not, what's problematic, what could we improve on, what could be things that maybe we'd like to address. So it's a relationship that's ever changing. It's not something that's set in stone. Um, and, and we do try to negotiate where possible because for us one of the difficulties with partnerships is power imbalances. And, and I think that's something, especially within the development sector, that we need to be conscious of. So overall, what would you say are the benefits of uh, investing in partnerships or collaboration? Well, I mean, the, the whole notion of working with others is key for us. I mean, I don't think any of the issues we try to tackle can be done on our own. I mean, like the scale of the challenges facing our communities, I think, require us to work with other organizations because we don't believe and we don't pretend we've got all the solutions. We understand that by learning with others, we'll improve our own practice. So the starting point for us is, is realizing we're not perfect, but we're good at certain things. And by working with others, we add value, hopefully, to each other's work. And, and it also kind of uncovers maybe blind spots that we have about our own practice, and um, maybe realizing things that we could do things differently. I think working on your own too much can lead to a space where yeah, you just you're not realizing the biases and the conditioning that, that we all suffer from. Mm. And overall, what what do you think are some of the main barriers or obstacles when it comes to establishing a partnership or collaborating with a, another organization? Yeah, I, I think that partnerships themselves need attention and focus that sometimes I think organizations don't give that space to. So that could come in the form of human resources or it could come in more of a financial term. But but I think they need resources in and of themselves. I don't think it's good enough just to do a project together and try to shoehorn resources in order to make the partnership work. For us, one of the main obstacles would be the fact that it needs to be much more organic. 
The ones that have worked for us are the ones that have more to them than just the project. The ones that have really been positive have been the partnerships where we really invested much, much more than just that which was written in a, in a project application. So I think that the obstacle really is realising that that's the case, that we need to realise that they need much more time to develop. And, and when, say, things do go wrong, as they often do, um, how, uh, how do you manage, manage tension or manage conflict? Yeah, I mean, I think like a relationship, there's bound to be tensions and conflict. And I would imagine that, you know, if we're realistic about it, those things should come up. And then, like you say, it's, it's how you deal with them. And I think that that's part of what you develop with a partnership, if it works, that when those things happen, that you begin to address them and that that's okay. So that you might have an expectation that A, B or C will happen in a particular time frame and that it's somebody's responsibility to do that. But at the same time, there needs to be the flexibility to understand that the world isn't perfect, that things will happen that will deviate your course and your journey and that that's okay, that that's allowed within the space of a partnership. Surely there's enough trust between organisations and entities for that to be allowable and for that to kind of maybe add value because it could take you in a way that maybe in the long run is more productive. And in establishing international partnerships, have you found that culture and language are, are big considerations? Yeah, I do. And, and also funding because I think it's really important like who holds the poor strings because I think sometimes I've seen in the past where maybe partnerships are called that when in actual fact they're more like a dictatorship. It's more like you're going to do A, B, C or D and it's not a partnership at all. So I think that one of the key things around cultural kind of like norms is, is things like space and time. I mean, again, going back to our Tanzanian partner, we have to allow for more space to happen, for, for meetings to happen in a way that might be culturally different to Ireland. But we have to respect that. We have to understand that if we're having a meeting in Tanzania and there's no electricity, as an example, then you know that, that's part of what goes on in the reality in that place. And for us to deal with that is just out of respect rather than becoming frustrated mm -hmm. that you haven't got the work done that day. So to anybody uh, setting out and starting out with a new partnership between uh, one or a number of other organisations, what do you think are some of the key ingredients that can help ensure that it's a successful partnership in the future? I think, honestly, a lot of it comes from values because I think if you begin with a kind of humility and a kind of respect for others and a willingness to work and learn from others, then you're in a good starting place for a partnership. But if you're on the phone to somebody because of a recent funding application and you're saying to yourself, well, I need this to work by the end of the month, I need something signed, I don't think that that's a healthy place to start. I think that, I would say that certainly practitioners should and could be on the lookout for partners when there isn't a funding application on the table in order to build relationships with entities that when something comes up, if an opportunity comes up, that you can begin to work together on something that's meaningful rather than funding led. Um, I think that that meaningful collaboration is much more important than something just for the sake of it. And so when we look at the state of the world now with the, the rise in kind of uh, the extreme right to a large extent and a lot of increasing racism and division, um, how important do you feel the role DevEd is and how do you think DevEd should respond in reaching out to forge new partnerships with perhaps different uh, partners that you may not have considered already? Yeah, I think there's a few things to that. One is that I think that development education as a sector has the skills to do much more of that work. I don't know whether or not the practitioners have the confidence to see themselves in, in that role. I also think that development education has at the core of its work the notion of trying to tackle power and politics. And I think that too many practitioners and organisations have veered away from that. Personally, and I think development perspectives should be more involved in doing more of that work. I think we've got the skill set to do it. Um, I think we've got the experience to do it. I think that sometimes organisations are a little bit scared because of maybe the possibility of funding pressures being kind of like mounted on them because of where they get their resources from. I don't think that that's something that independent NGOs should be paying as much attention as they seem to be paying to. So I would think that we need to tackle much more of these issues. Uh, I think we need to be involved in these discussions more. I think that we need to be talking more about the values that are underpinning some of these movements 
and trying to kind of tackle them while at the same time creating space for discussions that at the moment aren't being had. And then lastly, the point about partners, I think it would be important to reach out to communities that are maybe invisible to a certain extent within the development education sector to reach out more to groups that don't feel included, that feel excluded, because I think one of the breeding grounds that extreme movements have is working with communities that are more vulnerable and trying to kind of use propaganda as a way of getting them involved in what they're, they're doing. So I think we could and should use storytelling as one way of putting it, of trying to be much more inclusive in our work and trying to be a counter narrative to some of the dangerous things that are out there. Mm. Any final words of wisdom, Bobby? Wisdom? None. <laughs> no wisdom. <laughs> well said. Thanks so much for your time. No worries.